I'm Joanna Fabicon, and it is my honor to introduce our guests. But here's a little bit about them. Um, focusing on bringing positive representation and voice to the Asian community, Sujia and Ed decided to come together to bring that experience on a larger, for, a longer form medium through podcasting on What in the Shiba. Sujia is a mother of two and an entrepreneur who started TikTok during the pandemic for fun and quickly found herself helping people learn the difference between cultural appropriation and appreciation, especially as it pertains to the way Asian foods are portrayed and used by others. Ed is a photographer and cinematographer who runs an art-based clothing line and also started TikTok during the pandemic for fun and quickly found himself inspired to tell the stories of the victims of the Atlanta spa shootings that were ignored by the media. And that led to focusing on Asian stories and normalizing Asian experiences. So I said TikTok a lot during that introduction, so I thought it'd be inappropriate if I TikTokify this intro as well. So let's see your fingers, everyone. All right, lovely. This is just like story times, what, what we do with the kids. Okay, um, put a finger down if you've seen Sujia and Ed on your FYP. All right. Put a finger down if they are on your podcast rotation. Put a finger down if, like me, you found that their voices entertain and uplift. If through listening, you've felt validated, smarter, braver, angrier, but in a good way, I promise, and even more equipped to advocate for yourself and your community. Okay, I, I've run out of fingers. I know with TikTok that you just press stop, but um, with these fingers, I'll, I'll go like this and um, review and kind of recenter our themes for today. Wellness, healing, resilience and resistance, and all of that together equals joy. So with that, please joyfully welcome to the stage, Sujia and Ed. The introduction. Thank you. I was like, oh, I guess we are kind of cool. Thank you, Joanne. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sujia. I'm also Ed. Known as Susie. Um, and we are the hosts of the What in the Shibar podcast. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, what Shibar means, I'm not going to give you the direct translation, um, <laughs> but let's just say uh, it means like, heck, what in the heck? Um, and we raise that question a lot in our podcast. I'm Ed. And. Like, thank you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you all for being here. But welcome to One in the Shibar with Suji and Ed. We're just two Asian Americans who talk crap about stuff. That's not the usual tagline, but I'm in public. So. <laughs> but thank you all for being here. Um, I think just a little quick introduction. I mean, yeah. Joanna really kind of, I, I don't think I can yeah. say it better than, than what she said. Um, a lot of people ask, like, why do you do a podcast? Why are you on TikTok? What do you have to say? I don't know. I don't know why. I, I think the most remarkable thing when I started social media was so many people would comment to me, I've never seen anybody like you. I've never heard anybody like you. And I thought that was so strange because I was like, I'm not remarkable. I'm not anything special. I'm just a regular lady who just picked up, picked up her phone and just started talking to it. And I think that in and of itself was the motivator. I was like, why is there so little visibility? Why is somebody who's just so kind of average, normal mom, I work, I you know, drive my kids to school, pack lunches, why is that so unusual for people to see? And I think it was because the words that I was speaking were coming out of my Korean face. And people were not accustomed to seeing that and hearing that and hearing strong opinions and hearing you know, a lot of swear words come out of my mouth. And I think a lot of people have very firm and fixed ideas on what Asian women are and who we are. And obviously we all know we're not a monolith and we all know that we have different opinions and you know, we have different things to say and we experience life differently and we experience joy differently. And I was like, I want to just share that. And the only way I know how to do it is to just be as much myself as I possibly can be. And that's what I just try to bring every single day to, to the internet and to social media and to my podcast. 
Yeah, for me, I started doing this because I realized during the pandemic that we had to advocate for ourselves. Um, like Joanna said, specifically during the Atlanta spa shootings, you know, a lot of the victims were being forgotten. And then somewhere along the way, I became a really big advocate of the fact that the best way to eradicate racism, which is based in ignorance, is the is to fill that void with the absence of knowledge, right? So when we are able to normalize our stories, normalize our foods, our cultures, people will start to realize that we're not Asian people, right. we're just people. people. And so I thought, I thought that our podcast would be a place where we'd be able to have more of a discussion around that type of information rather than just like a one to three minute video that's just kind of very concise and, 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 and how important it was that the topics that we brought to the podcast weren't just centered in just being Asian. Obviously, being Asian and being Korean is a huge part of our identity, and we live it every single day. But I felt like it was just, we didn't want to be so just kind of one dimensional because we do so many other things. We have hobbies. We have loved ones. We have parents. We have trauma. We love food. We love jokes, we love movies, there's so many things. And I wanted just everyone to see that we're just whole entire people. And I think that was something that I feel like so many people were missing or like not even even realizing that they were missing. Cause so for somebody to say like, oh, you know, I, my Asian friend's mom is not like you. I'm like, of course she's not. Why would she be? She is a completely different person. I don't, oh, all the Asian women I know are only from this restaurant or this nail salon. Okay, well, guess what? Even within those spaces, those women aren't all like each other either. So let's let's work on that. Let's keep talking about that. And that was a conversation that I really thought was important to have. And the conversation is like, we're just living our lives. That's it. We're not doing anything spectacular. I mean, I like to think every once in a while we're spectacular, but not always. <laughs> Very... <laughs> average a lot of the time yeah in fact a lot of people ask us like what the podcast is about and that's why the tagline is our tagline we're just kind of talking about stuff about stuff so we don't really have a focus it's just more about bringing our thoughts our experiences our faces into the forefront forefront so that we're not just you know people who you well, know, I, have I think, attributes i think that's a big deal that's a big part of it right um is that People on the internet, they really procure who they are. They really make sure that everything is perfect. And I was like, I, that's exactly the opposite of what I want. I want people to see me just when I'm really vulnerable, when I'm scared, when I make a bad choice, when I you know, make the wrong decision, when I do something that is embarrassing, because I feel like everything is so curated in such a way that people aren't like really feeling who people are. And I think that's part of the problem with a lot of people, it's particularly a lot of people in the Asian community, is that we're so afraid to be embarrassed. We're so afraid to draw attention. We're so afraid to be loud. We're so afraid to be boisterous and laugh with our mouths wide open. And I was like, I want them to see that we can be all of those things all at once, in your face, at the same time. You don't like it? Too fucking bad. That's just how it is. Innovation, thank you. Yeah. And a weird thing kind of happened while we started doing this. I know for me specifically, you know, I thought we were like standing up and helping the community, but somewhere along the line, we kind of didn't realize that we were forming a community. And for me personally, that was something that was very amazing because uh, somewhere along the line, I think growing up wanting to fit in so much, I kind of distanced myself away from my Asian identity. And it was while doing this content that I really started to understand the importance of community and how much of an impact that had on me, which is why we're so honored to be here specifically for this, because AAPI joy is something that I feel like I am so proud to be <clears throat> now. Ed's always trying to make me cry. Yeah. He's going to make me talk I'm about it. I'm trying not to cry <laughs> all the time. In fact, someone just told me yesterday, I need to stop crying on my content. And I was like, That's why do you care? That's a big part of who you are, yeah. and that is okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that's a big part of it, too, for me, is just letting young Asian girls and women and even, you know, boys and young men or whomever see that, you know, there are people out there who look like them, who think like them, that they can relate to. And I think that is maybe the one thing I had expected the least. I did not expect to open my direct messages and see you know, DMs from like 14 year old girls. Like, I wish I had somebody like you. To, I'm so happy I have somebody like you to look up to and you, you give me a voice and you make me feel strong and you, you make me feel powerful. And I'm just like, powerful. I'm just, <laughs> just a puddle in my room, just bawling my eyes out. Just even the idea that I could, reach out and, and touch somebody's life in such a positive way and leave like a lasting impact. I, 
I always knew I wanted to do that. I just didn't know that it would be in this way. So having the opportunity and being so fortunate to be able to do that has been the privilege of my life, honestly. Like, and I know it sounds kind of silly, like, oh, I'm on a podcast where I do TikToks. It's so much more than that. And it, it, maybe not for anybody else in this room, but for me, it has been a profound joy. It has been a profound, life-changing experience for me. Yeah, I also agree. Right? And being yeah. Asian is badass, right? My, <laughs> right? I was at a volleyball game with my daughter's team um, a few months back, and it was during Chinese New Year. And one of the girls on the team had brought little fans for all the girls, and they were all fanning themselves like on the bench. And it was so cute. And I heard them walking off the stage, and one of them says to my daughter, being Asian is the coolest, isn't it? And I was like... <laughs> It really is. And I don't know that when I was their age, I ever felt that way. Because I wanted to hide it. I wanted to pretend. I will put sun in in my hair. Do I need blue contact lenses? What can I do to stop feeling so different? And to see that you're not that different. We're all actually kind of the same. We might look different. We might eat different food. But we're not that different in how we feel and how we think and how we love each other. So that's, that's yeah. how I try to bring every, you know, a moment. I mean, honestly, I didn't, I don't think I ever even imagined that something like this would happen in my lifetime. Like, right? I don't think this was <laughs> even a goal for me. Because I oh. think partially- oh, when you were a little boy, you weren't like, I'm going to make three minute videos and everyone <laughs> will know my name. <laughs> well, not even that, but I think it was mostly just like the fact that I, I was focused so hard on just fitting in, you know, just oh being God, normal. And- which is funny because that was never who I was as a person. So to be able to be amongst people like you and have an audience and know that we are able to build a community and advocate for each other has been something that has been really, I, I mean, it seems a lot of people write in thanking us and telling us how impactful we are, but I don't think people realize how impactful everyone has been. I've gotten way more from this than yeah. I think I could ever give ever. to anyone. I don't, I don't know that I have that much to give, but what I've gotten is, is incredible. Um, so that's how we got here, I guess. <laughs> he called me and was like, you want to do a podcast? I was like, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> sure, no problem. The funny thing is people think that we've been friends for a really long time, but we just, we met on social media. Yeah. In fact, I think we only met like one time for lunch. No, once for dinner and once for lunch before I was like, hey, you want to do a podcast? And Susie was like, yeah, sure. And I was like, oh, I had like a list of <laughs> stuff to convince you. <laughs> but uh really? okay <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know um i was like you know i mean why not I'll give it a try i don't know if anybody gives a crap and wants to listen but you know i'll try it and I've, I've really enjoyed it i mean there are definitely times where ed and i bicker like brother and sister and i've been like i'm gonna just flip this fucking table and leave you're pissing but me off so much but literally said that house. two weeks ago <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of it right that's that's the whole part that's a big part of it is our humanity Yes, we are human people that drive each other crazy, just like everybody else. And that, I think, is always kind of the underlying theme is, like, we are so exoticized all the time. Like, oh, my God, your hair is like silk and your skin is like porcelain. I'm like, get the fuck away from me. Stop touching me. Don't stop looking at me like that. It's so weird. And it's, like, just normalizing being normal. That's really all I ever wanted. Just And that, you know, to what Ed said is, you know, growing up in the 80s as, you know, a teenager in a predominantly white town, feeling like a fish out of water, sore thumb, every, you know, euphemism that you can think of. I was like, oh my God, everybody just thinks I'm so different. I just want to be the same. And so then I would make bad choices. I would do things that were out of my character because I was like, okay, well, this is, this is what they want from me and this is how I'm going to fit in. Even though I, I would have been, I could have been fine. I, I don't know. I didn't give myself the opportunity. I didn't give myself the chance because I was like, I just want friends. I just want friends. And even those friends oftentimes made me feel like shit anyway, you know? So that's, if I can spare one teenage kid from having to experience fr like their friends, you know, s singing racially <laughs> insensitive songs to them or asking them if they, you know, eat dog, I'm gonna do it. And if that means I have to put myself out there and get, you know, whatever negativity on social media, I have, I'll do it. That's fine, I don't care. Cause any kid that is spared just one moment of that, I'll take the hit, it's fine with me. It's fine with me. I've, I've lived through enough, I can take it. Yeah, I was uh, I was born in Los Angeles, and I lived here till I was like in first grade. And I went to a school that was literally ninety five percent Korean. If you guys are familiar with like Coenga High School at the time, it was like predominantly Korean. We had a Korean principal, and then when I was seven years old, um, my mom moved us to Philadelphia, and all of a sudden, I moved to a place where 
every time my friends would say something that was a little off the cuff, if you will. And it's I, just a joke. Yeah. That's literally what they would say. They'd be like, oh, it's such a joke. In you're fact, so, you're so sensitive. They would double down and say things like, Ed, you're the whitest person I know. And I, every time I used to be like, mm. Mm, I don't know. I don't feel like I experienced the world that way. And it wasn't until I moved back here 11 years ago when my mom moved to Korea. And as an only child of a single mother, I was like, oh, I don't have to be here anymore. I was like, because I've always, even when we moved there, the first thing I said to my mom was, I hate it here. I'm moving back to LA the first chance I get. And she told me, she was like, I miss my family and friends. And I said to her, I was like, well, as the only child, I was like, that's offensive. And as I was saying the word offensive, it came to me that nothing was tying me down anymore. And when I moved back here, I was talking with some of my friends. And when I told them that story, every single one of them their jaws dropped on the floor and they were like, that's one of the racist things I've ever heard. And I was like, oh my God, I knew it. So the idea of community is really important because, and we do drive, try to drive that home. Well, I could look across this room and tell you that every single person in here that is not white, that's my husband, so accept him, <laughs> has had some kind of experience, right? Where we can all relate. We can all relate. Somebody's saying like, oh, you know, your family eats dogs or your food stinks or, you know, your whatever, whatever. Oh, your immigrant parents are X, Y, and Z. We've all experienced that. Like relatability, if you want to talk about relatability, just get a room full of Asian people in their, you know, 30s, 40s together. We've all had the same experiences. We've all had those same words thrown at us. We've all had people say, you know, ching chong is just a joke. It's it's a term of endearment or whatever bullshit they want to give you to make it seem like what offensive shit is not as, it, sorry, I'm just getting, I'm getting a little more relaxed. So my mouth is, I'm, <laughs> I might be a little bit more liberal with my words, you know, but we all get gaslit into thinking like, oh, this is normal. I guess it's normal from people to make, if, if it's normal, why do I feel so bad? Why is this normal thing that's just a joke the one thing that I'm not laughing at that's making me feel the absolute worst. How is that possible that you see it as something that's funny while I'm sitting here wanting to just crawl out of my skin? And I think that's so relatable. I feel like we've all had that experience where it's like, you know, you're sitting there in a room full of non-Asian people and you feel just like so embarrassed and you just are like, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to ride that out because I don't know what else to do. And I don't want to make a big scene. Well, I have now for myself given myself the permission and maybe other people make a scene. It's okay. Make a scene. You can stand up and say, you know what? That's not okay. I don't accept that. You're a fucking asshole and I'm leaving. That, you know, I know it might be aggressive. I know that maybe that the last part might be a little aggressive. I think it's a little theme right now, right? <laughs> to be disruptive, right? To be disruptive, to right? Quote, Resist. Yeah. You know, we have to because I don't want any, I don't want this to continue. I don't want this to continue where we all feel like we are so, um, I don't know. These experiences are not unique. I feel like if I asked every person individually, has that happened to you? Yeah, I feel like I feel like you unilaterally, we would all say yes, or at least oh, I think yeah. so. And I think it's a privilege to be here too, where we do have a community like this because we do. I get emails and DMs all the time with people being like, "I live in you know this part of America where I am by myself," and I know what that's like because when I lived here, I remember distinctly my mom making kimbap for my teacher. And being like, oh, go bring this to your teacher. And then I remember the first day of lunch when I moved to Philadelphia, I brought bulgogi. You know, like if you guys have bulgogi, you know like how amazingly delicious it is. And I got so hardly bullied for it that I went home to my mom and I said to her, I don't want Korean food anymore. I want turkey and cheese. And from second grade till I graduated high school, she made me turkey and cheese sandwiches the same way with the same ingredients All the delicious every food day. you missed out on because yeah. of that. That's so sad. <laughs> yeah, and like people are still going through that. And I think it's amazing that we have, you know, tools like social media and the internet and YouTube and podcasts yeah, yeah. that are able to bring people together regardless of where we are. Seeing kimchi in a like restaurant that serves like sandwiches is like the craziest thing to me. Or like in Costco. Like, but it's, you know, what? I think because the ubiquitous niche, it's so much more prevalent and prominent yeah. on the internet and people can see it and they, I want to experience that. I want to see what that's like, you know? So, 
you know, to, to go from, a, in my childhood, somebody telling people that we kept dead body parts in jars in my, my kitchen, in our, you know, refrigerator, to my nine-year-old daughter asking if she can take kimchi to school. Like, that is quite the trajectory in just one generation. And I want to continue that. I want that feeling. I want that feeling of like, oh my God, I feel so proud. And she came home and she's like, you didn't give me enough to give to everybody. And I was like, everybody wanted him? She's like, yes. I'm like, oh my God. Like, let me just heal for a second. The healing is happening and it's, it's, I can feel it. And it feels so good. And I want to just, you know, continue that for everybody if I can in just one small way. Maybe one mom in, I don't know, Hoboken or what was what, really Hoboken. Okay. Or like some random, you know, place in Omaha, Jay-Z. Nebraska sees me cooking tteokbokki and she's like, I want to try that. And then she tries it. Her kid tries it. And their kid tells her other kids, friends about, I mean, whatever it is, however that snowball happens, it's happening. And I feel like, you know, we have to just keep being, keep showing up. And if we keep showing up it'll happen more and more and we can have the community will get bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger and that's you know that's all i that's all i could want for for my kids yeah you want to move on to okay so since you guys are part of the podcast you guys are going to be part of one of our favorite types of podcasts the hat thing okay (laughs) so we're going to do a segment we like to call questions you've always wanted to ask an asian person but we're too afraid to ask but sometimes people aren't afraid to ask, and that's kind of the point, too. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes people will ask it, and you're like, I can't believe you just asked me that. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. You want me to go first? Yeah. Okay, I'll go first. Oh, God, I hate when people say this. Say something in Korean. <laughs> Why don't my Asian friends like it when I ask them to tell me to say, or, or say something in their spoken language, in their in their language. I hate that so much. Say my name in Korean. Robert. <laughs> like, <laughs> this used to happen to me. What do you mean? Yeah. Like your in, name in Korean is still Robert, dude. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? We, I would like be at parties and people would just stop the music when my mom would call and they'd be like, oh my God, Ed's about to speak in Korean. And I would purposely just speak in English to my mom, you know? Right. And even to the point where people were like, Ed, say something in Korean. I would literally just retort with something in Korean. <laughs> Because I hated it. I'm like, I'm, we're not a zoo animal, right. you know? And if you want to learn Korean, um, go learn Korean. And I promise you, if you keep pressing me to say something in Korean, it's not going to be kind. Okay? <laughs> okay. Probably, Just want to clear that up with you. Yeah. It's probably something Shiba. Right, Shiba related. <laughs> oh, why do Asians look so young? Skincare, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Genetics. I think, I think there's, you know, Korean skincare is a huge thing. We all like to take care of our skin. I mean, I'm not gonna say that I don't dabble in Botox. I mean, let's just be honest. Um, maybe more than dabble. <laughs> um, I think also just our facial structure, where we hold fat in our face, I think makes us look a little bit more youthful. Even though, you know, I don't know. Maybe also because of some infantilization. Maybe. A hundred percent of that. Eek, yeah. Right. It was funny. It was one of those things where, like, when I was younger, I did everything to not look young, and now I'm like, oh, God, please, I need I need the cellulose up here. But the thing that I also resent, if people are like, oh, my God, you're so lucky you have good Asian skin. I'm like, do you have any idea how much money Korean women invest in their skincare? <laughs> like, it doesn't come for free. Skincare. It's not just because we lucked out. It's because yeah. we slather ourselves with elixirs and potions all, all and day. And eating day. a lot of cellulose, yeah, you know? Yeah, like, Sunscreen, Everything. three you know inches of sunscreen on your face. That's why. Look into it. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Okay. We're gonna have questions. We're gonna allow you guys to ask questions at the end too. Why do Asian people hate ask be, hate being asked where are you from? Oh my see, see that, see this collective. Mm, it's because we've all had that question. Where am I from? Yeah. Um, is the answer Los Angeles good enough? No. Never. Where are you really from? Like, do you want to know which suburb of Los Angeles? Is that what you mean? No. Like, where are you really from? Dude, just ask me. What is my ethnicity? If you really want to know. But it annoys me. But it's the why. Why? Why do you need why to Why is know? it important? You know why it's important? Because you want to tell me how much you love K-pop. Because you want to tell me, because you want to be able to say something. And I understand. This is, I'm not to say, it's not to say that people aren't just genuinely interested in you or like want to get to know you. 1%. But I, 
I feel like if somebody genuinely wants to get to know you, these things will come out in conversation anyway. I don't know any Korean person that in the first maybe 10 sentences doesn't proclaim, oh, I'm Korean. I, you know, let me take you to my favorite Korean restaurant or whatever. If you, if it comes up in conversation, don't worry. Like, we'll tell you, you'll know. And we'll probably volunteer it if you give us enough time. I mean, and when I say enough time, like three minutes, maybe. <laughs> like, that's, like yeah. that's all not, I need, I'll tell lot. you. You know, and... And then they get so offended, right? Where are you from? I'm from LA. Where are you really from? When I'm like, really from LA. Uh, no, but like, really, like, really. I'm from those two people. Yeah. That's where I'm really, really from. Those two people right there. That's where I'm from. When they used to ask where my parents were from, I sometimes used to just lie. To be like, also from LA. <laughs> I, I, just, I thought you were going to say like, I just wanted to be so contrarian. You know what I mean? Like really stick it to them. Like. Right. How, why can't I be from here? Because right. I don't know how well educated you are, but like your family's not from here either. Right. Well, and that of course pl plays into the perpetual foreigner myth, right? There's no way I could be from LA. Look at my face. I can't be from Los Angeles, even though I was born and raised in Los Angeles, but there's, but, but you know what I mean? Yeah. No, what do you mean? Let's ignore Tell the me. fact that Koreatown's like a third of Los <laughs> yeah. Angeles. What do you mean? I don't look like I could be from here. I mean. Hmm. Are your parents strict? Slash, why are they so strict? Mine are, my, mine are here. I'm not going to call them out <laughs> like that. <laughs> my mom was very strict. If you've watched any of my content, there is a lot of trauma that I'm working through. But I think generally as a whole, a lot of Asian cultures have the... You know, a lot of us came from like developing countries, war-torn countries. You come to a new land and I think it's, I don't think it's even just an Asian thing. I think it's a very immigrant, immigrant thing, thing yeah. to put your head down, do your work and just let your work speak for you. And I think that goes, it goes far to a certain extent. It can only go so far. It can though. only, yeah, that's, that's, thank you. It can only go so far because at some point you have to do more. You have to speak up. You have to be an individual and, you know? I think from what I can surmise from my childhood is that a lot of it was protective, right? They don't, didn't really necessarily understand the world around them because they were new here too. And so I was like, well, in an effort to keep them safe, I'll keep them at home. And since they're gonna be home anyway, they might as well read the encyclopedia you know, or whatever. And, you know, I think that had a lot to do with it. I think for my parents though, and I, I don't wanna speak for them necessarily, but I think they tried to be strict with us, but I'm one of three girls. And, you know, when you have three girls who are all pretty smart, you find ways around the strictness and, you know, I think, like I said, it, again, it was like, you know, if you work hard, you study hard, you're going to be successful. And, you know, maybe it was just, that's what they were taught, but that's not necessarily the path for everybody. I know it wasn't the path for me. Um, I don't think that they ever were like, if you study hard and you sit in this room and you read and read and read, one day you'll have 2 million TikTok followers. That was not, that was not the plan. <laughs> that was definitely not the plan. But, you know, I feel like immigrant parents in particular, they do what they can with what they know and what they got. And, you know, I give them grace for that because that I can't even imagine. I can't imagine being like moving to what Norway and then being like, OK, I'm just going to be part of Norwegian culture now and know everything about it and the language and how their culture works and the food. Yeah. I, how incredibly overwhelming that must be. Like, I can't even imagine what that must be like. And to not even speak the language. It's like, yeah, you know what? You get some slack on that from me anyway. Yeah, especially because when they're trying to just survive and not realizing the difference in cultures as well. Uh, oh, yeah, that yeah. was hard. Because, like, for them, it's like, hey, put your head down and work, you know, make something of yourselves. And we're being told in school to be an individual. Right. You know, to find your passions and become yourself and, you know, do this and do that. And, and there's it's hard. It's like slumber parties. Yeah. I want to go to a slumber party. What do you mean? You have a bed here. Why would you sleep at somebody else's house? Well, I don't know them. They could be gross <laughs> or, like, whatever. And I'm like, no, I mean, that's what kids do. They go to other people's houses and sleep there. That's not what we do. It's like, oh, okay, well, I guess I won't be joining the slumber party. And, you know, of course I wanted to, but in retrospect, like, yes, that's kind of weird. <laughs> you know, like, I, I understand why to them that would be such a foreign concept. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't have slumber parties while, like, you know, trying to survive a war. Right. <laughs> that's the truth. I take personal offense to this. Why are Asian women such bad drivers? Excuse me. 
I am an incredible driver. I haven't, you know what? Hold on. <laughs> Wait. I haven't gotten a ticket in a really long time. I, I, I speed, but I do it in a way that, you know, I haven't gotten caught. <laughs> Why am I about? I, I don't I know. I mean, I don't think Ask you are. a bad driver. I don't know. I think that's just sexist on top of being racist. Well, it's just funny because if you've ever been to Asia, they're like more aggressive than New York drivers. Yeah. I feel like, you know. But um, <laughs> but like, I don't think my aunt is here, but she is a bad driver. <laughs> but she's an individual. You know what I mean? She doesn't speak for everyone. Stereotypes. I will say though, sometimes if I cut somebody off or like I do something in traffic that I know I shouldn't have done, I'm like, oh, God dang it. They think I'm a bad driver because I'm Asian. Oh, that's the worst. <laughs> that's the worst. Oh I man, you're like, thank God I have tinted windows because I'm like, please don't look in. Please don't look in. Please I'm don't like, look in. I'm not a bad driver because I'm Asian. I just made a bad choice in that moment. Yeah. Don't judge me. We all make mistakes, but it's the worst when they look in and then they do this look. They're like, Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. checks out. Yeah. Why is the model minority stereotype bad? So bad. Oh right? I mean, realistically, Why all is it so bad stereotypes are bad. you're good at math. Well, because I'm not. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm really bad at math. Ask my dad. I'm so bad at math. I really hate being a stereotype sometimes, but. Well, for a number of reasons, right? If I am good at math, it's because I'm Asian, not because I work hard or because I study harder, because I do everything to try to be good at math. And if I'm not good at math, like, well, what's wrong with you that you're not good at math? It's like, no stereotype is a good stereotype. Even if it sounds like it's good, it's really, it, it does nothing but further, you know, st you know, more stereotypes and harsher stereotypes onto people. God. Yeah, and we now know in the you know 2020s that many of us who were good at school were neurodivergent. <laughs> Surprise! So we didn't we didn't get the attention we needed to. You know, in fact, in seventh when I was seven years old, um, a teacher gave me like you know an ass a ass assessment, and she told me at the age of seven, your brain works differently than other people. She said you're going to have a hard time having people understand you, and that was it. That was it. There was no other assessment. There was no guidance. It was just, you're weird. Good luck. Good luck with that. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. Yeah. Let us know how that works out. <laughs> okay, I'm seven. <laughs> Which I think also helped fuel me wanting to just like fit in more. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, of course. Like sometimes I used to think like, oh my God, am I a sociopath? Because I sit home and I wonder if I do this, if I talk like this, if I take part in this, like, Am I going to be seen normal, you know? And I got you. Think no one's going to just say no? Okay. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm just no, kidding. Ed. No, yeah. Fine. But, but that's just, you know, what it is. And But stereotypes from the model minor, minority standpoint, it's, there's no, there should be no expectation. You know what I mean? Of there's this, you're not an individual anymore. You're just this Part person. Part of this monolith yeah. that is only good at one thing, or we expect you to be one thing, so. Do you all know karate? <laughs> Answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I kick your ass. <laughs> I actually always found that weird, you know? Like when it's convenient, they sing they say things like, hi yeah, and like whatever. I hate that. But then they think they can pick on me. Like, which, which one is it? is it? Like if you think I know karate and you're talking all this trash to me, doesn't that make you not that smart? Because you know that I can probably kick your butt. <laughs> I don't yeah. get it. it. Makes no kind of sense. No. And no, we don't all know karate. But I know crazy. But I, <laughs> oh, why do so many Asian people own nail salons? There is actually a real answer to that, right? Um, Tippi Hedren, who was an actor in a very famous movie called The Birds, Alfred Hitchcock movie. She, I, I can't remember the exact circumstances, but there were refugees from Vietnam and she had, they were like enthralled with her nail lady who came to this like refugee camp, like the education center. And she was getting her nails done and they were all like, whoa, this is so interesting. Like what's going on? And so she basically started schools to teach Vietnamese refugees how to do nails. And so, you know, as we all know in, you know, immigrant communities, they will find one kind of business and then help other people start that same kind of business. And then it just concentrically like grows from there, you know, like a dry cleaner or a liquor store. And these things kind of grow and grow. And that is why so many nail salons are run by Asian people. I, I think like 
of the nail salons in California, or maybe Los Angeles specifically, are run by Vietnamese people. I thought oh, that was so interesting. Technically, they invented it, kind of. I mean, I don't know if they invented it, but they've definitely perfected, perfected it, because my nails look <laughs> amazing right now. <laughs> this is cute. <laughs> Why do so many Asian people play the piano? <laughs> do you play the piano? I do not. Oh. My parents wanted me to play the piano, and they put my, speaking of our brains, my brain does not do that. How do you make your left hand and your right hand do different things? It's a miracle. How do you, people who play the piano, I'm like in awe of. I'm like, my brain, every time I try to do something, it won't. It won't do it. I, I can't do it. So... They don't all play the piano because I couldn't if I if my life depended on it. I can't do it. Do but you, I, I you don't do. Play the piano. Oh, piano? Yeah, I haven't in a long know. time, but I do. See? Yeah. We are not a monolith. <laughs> Another stereotype I do fit into, but my mom forced me to, you know? And uh, I think a lot of uh, with Asian people, it's I think they had some knowledge before everyone else that... Because music really helps to, you know, connect the neurons in your brain and stuff. And I think. You know what I think is really funny? I heard a comedian say, like, it's so funny how Asian parents invest so much in their kids playing instruments. Like, they make you, they hammer it and you play the piano, play the piano, play the piano. I got a job playing the piano on a tour. You can't play piano for a living. It's like, yeah. what? Then why did you make me do this for so many years? Like, did you want me to be successful? No, we just wanted you to learn it, and that's it. Yeah. Play for our friends at Christmas, that's it. Be a doctor, but also know how to play the cello, <laughs> which is actually part of the reason why I, I auditioned for Juilliard without my say, mom Did you guys know he got into Juilliard? Yeah. How crazy is that? So, yeah, thanks. I, uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I, thanks. I, <laughs> well, it's just something I put past me for so long, but when I was um, the senior in high school, or junior in high school, I, like, snuck on a bus told my mom we were going on like a field trip, went to Juilliard and auditioned. And then uh, I somehow got in and uh, I, I haven't told my mom. I was gonna say, does she not know still? She still doesn't know? No. Does she not listen to the podcast? Like what the fuck? No. <laughs> yeah. We need she more streams, know. guys. No. She really doesn't know? No, I don't think she does. The next podcast, we're gonna have Ed call his mom in Korea and tell her <laughs> that he got into Juilliard without her knowing. So stay tuned for that, because yeah. that's crazy that she doesn't know yet. I don't know that all. I want her to. Why? I don't know. I feel like she'll be disappointed. Oh, yeah. What? Well, that's The so, Asian that's, guilt I was just saying, why. that is confusing. You think she'd be disappointed that you got in or that you, you didn't, didn't tell go. her or they didn't go? But she didn't want you to go. Well, I don't know that. So tell her. But my mom was out. very controlling, you know. I, I like. I think I, got, I applied to like twenty colleges. I got into fifteen of them, and she only allowed me to go to two of them. What? Yeah, like she didn't let me go to NYU because she didn't want to be in New York by myself. She my didn't parents. want me to go to Boston University or Boston College because there's weird Koreans there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there are weird Koreans everywhere. Yeah. So I was like, why, why did you allow me to even apply to these places? Like, why did we spend so much, you know? That but. is really crazy. God, if I got into 15 colleges, my parents would have been overjoyed. I was like, I got into this one. I'm going to go to this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I picked University of Delaware to be spiteful. Mm -hmm. Spiteful to who? Yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Unbeknownst Just to kidding. me, it was, but yes. Why? How are Asian people all so skinny? Oh, that is so triggering. Isn't that so triggering? Oh, my God. Yeah. I have been every weight you can possibly imagine. So when people, depending on where I am in my weight or my body, oh, you're so skinny. It's because you're Asian. I'm like, oh, you're so fat for an Asian. <laughs> it's like, I, you know what? I just am what I am. I don't know. I don't know what that stereotype. I mean, that stereotype is so ridiculous. Yeah. I there was are, never skinny, skinny. I've either. never been skinny a day in my life. Yeah. Ever. Well, we also get like you're so tall too. Like I like I'm just like a weird yep. anomaly. I'm five eight and definitely not 110 pounds. Yeah. For a long time, people used to ask me if I was half white, and it wasn't until maybe like the 30th. People person. thought you were half white. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it always blew my mind because I was like, I'm pretty Asian and like like textbook very guys. <laughs> Korean looking. And it wasn't until like the 30th person that I finally, when someone asked me, I was like, Hey, can I ask you a question back? Are you asking me that because I'm so tall? And they were like, but you're just so tall. And I well, was at least like, they weren't like, it's because you're so fat. <laughs> <laughs> I 
which is also confusing because my mom was always like, you need to lose five pounds, but also here's a third helping of rice. Oh, that's such a tough one. And I don't want to call my parents out, but that was a lot of it too. Like, oh, you've really gained weight. You should here, eat this, <laughs> yeah. have more of this. Yeah. Well, I don't, that's confusing to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my neurons are not neuroning. <laughs> one time my mom literally was like, rice is fattening, here, have some more. And I was like, <laughs> what? It's like, so you just wanted me to know. So I felt the shame of it while yeah. I'm eating it. Cool, yeah. just want to make sure that we're on the same you page. You just want to keep me down. Oh, that's a tough one. Whatever, I'm at the point, I'm like, I like food, I'm gonna eat it all. Same. Oh. I mean, this is a good question, because can you tell the difference between the different types of Asian? Sometimes, right? <laughs> but like, I don't want to answer that in mixed company, right? I'll answer that in front of all you guys, because we were all predominantly Asian, but like if a white person asks me, I'm like, you know what, that is really offensive. Although there are- <laughs> <laughs> Why do you want to know? But if it was like, like an Asian person asking me, like, sometimes I can tell, or at least sometimes I think I'm right, you know? But you know, like they say, what's that, what's that phrase? Like, you know, you gotta, Mixed company. You got to make sure you know who you're talking yeah. to and who's asking the question. But I get people ask me if I'm Japanese all the time. I think I look very Korean, but you know, so yes and no. Sometimes the complexion, sometimes the bone structure. But I think as I like meet more Asian people, the more differences in the differences I see. And I didn't grow up with a lot of Pacific Islander friends. I, like, I didn't. I don't think I met a Filipino person until I went to college. You know. So I think now, like having a much broader like swath of people to, to look at. I'm starting to see the differences, but then I'm starting to see like, oh, those differences aren't as concrete as some might think. Yeah, I've never, I've even, I get so offended because white people come up to me all the time. They'll just be like, oh. and you guys hear, and be like, oh, I hate this. But, I hate but literally so a much. couple weeks ago, I was um, in line for fried chicken because that's my whole personality. <laughs> and <laughs> it is. And um, it was at JNG, which is a Taiwanese fried chicken place. And these three little uh, Chinese women came up to me and they started speaking Chinese to me. And I was like, I don't know what to do right <laughs> now. So I just nodded my head and said, yes. <laughs> I didn't Correct. say anything. I just nodded in my head. And I was That's like, my favorite when people go. like walk up to you and like treat you like you're like a spinning wheel in a game show. And they're like, Japanese, right? Japanese? I'm like, no, Chinese. I knew it, Chinese. No, I'm, I'm not that either. Hmm, I don't know any other types of Asian. I'm like, just, p just pick a different one. I mean, just keep going. How, how long is, could this go on? Here, do you want a map? You could just point at all the different ones and just keep guessing or do you want me to just tell you? I hate that. I, I guarantee you those people couldn't even point. <laughs> literally, literally. That's Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe we'll do a couple more and then. Why is Asian food so spicy? Because it's delicious. <laughs> Why? Why is it so spicy? I think sriracha, that's right. Because, well, chili peppers, I think I, I, there's going to be some kind of geographical trade or I don't know. I don't know. I don't know because it tastes good. That's that's my answer. Maybe somebody here knows. I don't think there's a reason. Because it's good. Right. Because we know spice. Because we like to sweat. Because we like things exciting. We want to yeah. keep things exciting. And you're talking to someone. I used to eat gochujang out of the jar. And um, my mom actually stopped buying it for a while because she told me I was going to die of an ulcer at the age of 10. Well, she's not wrong. <laughs> she's that wrong. It's so salty. And then I used to think that I was like so, you know, I was like so proud of the fact that I can eat spicy foods. And then I developed a spice allergy. Oh. Recently, it's nothing serious. I'm not gonna like die. I think, but my face gets very sweaty. It doesn't stop there. <laughs> it's very sweaty. It drips. We did like a hot chicken wing challenge on the, the podcast. And I was like, I feel like you're gonna die. <laughs> This is bad. I was like, I Do, love this so much. Should I call an ambulance? He was pouring sweat. He was so red. And I was like, he's like, let's keep going. I was like, no, I feel like you're going to sue me. Like, I'm like, this is medically irresponsible. Like, I don't want this to It's really embarrassing at restaurants. Like, I'll go eat, like, kaguksu or something. And then um, I'll have to keep asking for napkins, like, 17 times. You know what I say? Embrace it. Just sweat into your food. It'll just add salinity. It's fine. <laughs> It needed a little salt more, anyway. More flavor, it's fine. <laughs> Although recently I used to think that like, oh, you know, I eat gochujang and we can eat Chinese, uh, like really spicy foods until until someone gave me like Thai spicy foods. And I was like, what? Whole new world. What is happening? Changed your life. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> my body hates me. Those little, little tiny ones. Oh my God. Jeez. Why is it so Changed spicy? Changed the whole trajectory of your week. Yeah. Blasting out her face. <laughs> 
What's the Asian glow or why do you get so red when you drink? I don't have that. What? Mm -mm. I'm so lucky. Thanks, Dad. Uh, <laughs> when I drink, I don't, my, my color does not change at all. That's wild. Really? Does, do you guys have that? Do all of you have it? A lot of you? You have it? You have it? Oh, really? I so don't. now science tells us we're lacking an enzyme yes. that breaks down the alcohol protein. I won the enzyme lottery, guys. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't have that. I actually had a friend in college, John, and he would drink at parties and stuff, and he would turn, you guys, so red, like purple. And I was like, your body is trying to tell you something. Like, you don't look okay so red to the point I was like, this can't be worth it. You, this, for you, this can't be worth it. I don't care how much fun you think you're having. Your head looks like it's going to pop off the top of your neck. This is not okay. But no, my sisters don't have it. I don't have it. So My mom's allergy to alcohol is actually so bad that one time we ate at a restaurant where they made the salad dressing out of red wine vinegar. And she got sick. Like out of she, that bad? Yeah, she had to like go lay down. We had to like borderline almost had to take her to the hospital. And on the flip side, my dad was a raging alcoholic. So, uh, so maybe yeah. this was nature's way of protecting you. Yeah, we'll look at it that way, yeah. right? Maybe that's that's what what happened. Okay, we'll do this last one. Last one. Make it a good one. If it's not a good one. Put it back in the hat. <laughs> Don't blow it. We got one last shot. <laughs> Do you have to marry someone from your own culture? No. No, I don't. <laughs> no, I like who I mean, I'm sure of course there are parents who want their children to to do that. Um I'm lucky enough that my parents are open-minded enough to know that who I fall in love with is who I fall in love with and that's all that matters. But yeah, there are definitely I, I think a lot of it has to do with maybe wanting to be able to connect with the person that your child has chosen. And, you know, a lot of people don't think they can do that in, you know, with people outside of their own cultures, which I think is a shame. I think that's a shame. Um, I don't have that issue, clearly. Do you? My mom tried to push it on me for a while growing up. Like my aunt married a white guy and every once in a while she'd be like, oh, she would say something like a little passive aggressive and then- An Asian mom being passive aggressive? Yeah. That's so weird. Especially my mom, who'd <laughs> have thunk. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, but then like I always brought home, I think the only Asian girlfriend I ever had was my first girlfriend when I was like seven. She wasn't even a real girlfriend, you know what I mean? Oh, that's yeah, cute. our kiss was like, you know, so like- <laughs> You know what I think might've changed it for my parents is I did have a Korean boyfriend in college and his parents treated me so poorly. Like they were so cruel to me. They said the craziest shit to me. Like they were so offensive, so rude to me. And I think, you know, I told my mom and I think she was just like, huh, yeah, it's okay. You don't, you know what? You find somebody that you love and whose family treats you well, that's what's important. Cause you're, I don't want you ever being treated like this again. Cause. I was like, mom, please don't fight his mom. That's really, it's <laughs> too far. But, you know, I think that, I think the longer they've lived here, the more they realize, like, it's okay. Like, love who you love. I got lucky, I guess. Yeah, my, I mom, my mom pretty much accepted the fact that it's just going to be whoever at this point. Yeah. Now she's like. Please, just somebody. Yeah, she's like, <laughs> anybody. Anybody? It's a catch, guys. Don't miss out. <laughs> uh, that was fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, do any, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, do any of you have any questions for us? Yes, sir. Oh, oh, you have a microphone? <gasps> You're like Oprah. <laughs> okay, my name you is Frank mic, uh, mic. Martinez. I'm from Downey, California. Now, I grew up there in 1974, and I was the first Mexican-American in the home neighborhood, you know, like white. And 1976, Calvin Chung, Chinese-American. We went through middle school three years together. Um, he introduced me to his culture. I just, we both shared our culture. It's so beautiful. beautiful. And I, we still fought over the taquito. No, it's an egg roll, you know. That. <laughs> but, but as I got older, 1980s come around. And since Downey, there's a Norwalk, Norwalk uh, Japanese American Community Center. So I meet Steve Kawasaki. And he introduced me to judo and kendo, which I still do today. Oh, cool. And uh, as time went by in the 95, uh, I met Iksu Kim, my neighbor. Um, and then for 20, 2012 to 20, no, 2012 to 2020, I worked in Jefferson, Indiana, Mishawaka, Indiana, 
Louisville, Kentucky, and, oh. and Shepherdsville, Kentucky. So just being back home. I was going to say, yeah. it's I mean, good to be back. <laughs> uh, the, and, and, and every person that was Asian or so, you know, I, we, we became friends. They, they opened up to me. I'm, I'm Mexican-American, but mm -hmm. the, I knew them. We were like family. It, yeah. it was, I didn't see any... It, it, it's like, yeah, I like this. I like this kimchi. Well, I think that's such an advantage of living in a place like Los Angeles. You know, you go one neighborhood, one street down, you're in a whole different place. You get to see and experience so many different, you know, types of people and foods and, you know, cultures. It's it's such a beautiful, wonderful, fortunate thing for us to live yeah. here. Yeah, and um, you say when I go to little Tokyo and uh, we get that, uh, I think they use the dough at, you know, The mochi? The mochi, yeah, right. So, like I tell my friends, you know, my Mexican friends, it's like a tamal the <laughs> outside, but <laughs> right. they just, it's the reverse. So. Well, yeah, that's why Ed and I actually do talk about food so much, because if you really look at it, across the board, there's always something you have in common. One culture has something in common, and I think that's just how the world works, right? But I think that's such a beautiful way for us to be able to relate to each other. I mean, and what's better than sharing food with somebody that you want to get to know? Like, that's one of the best ways. Like, breaking bread with somebody is, oh, yeah. honestly, I think the most beautiful way to, to connect. And for two years, from seventh to eighth grade, we were bringing tacos, burritos. Yes. You bring his, you know, his uh, uh, egg rolls and all. I love it. We were making money. Hey, <laughs> entrepreneurship, I like it. And, and just one thing, um, it is true, his mom did put him in piano classes. So I, every Saturday, not that, I mean, that white guy again. I mean, there's something to say about that. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> My mom wants me to learn it. I'm sorry. I'm like, oh. Well, thank you so much for sharing no, that. You. I appreciate that. Does anybody have any questions? Anything at all? Oh. I've never had to do this on a stage before. I'm like, who's out there? <laughs> What's the secret, like, Korean restaurant that we don't know about in that we need to know about? My mom's house. But your mom's <laughs> house. Okay. How do we get there? <laughs> That's where I go to eat Korean food. There's no better Korean food in town, and I'm not giving up the address. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I honestly, like, I usually cook at home. I honestly haven't, I don't go to, like, the trendy Korean places. I'm, I like to just stay home. Dude, where do you go? Um, it depends. You know, whatever I'm in the mood for. This Outside of Korea, L.A. has the most diverse mm. Korean food. Um, you, you can find specialties in anything. Like, if you want, like, chicken soup, there's places that just make, like, the Korean chicken soup, like, samgyetang and stuff. But, yeah, I don't some know. Rec recommendation, give them one. Come on. Or, or are they too secret that that uh, the, uh, outside of you the community know, like, you, we can't know? With the little Korean <laughs> harmony in the front. You know, one of the best introductory places that I do take people, especially my like out of town friends, is um, Hamji Park. Oh yeah, in uh, Koreatown. Uh, I was say. They probably have like the best pork ribs Ooh, like I've ever had. Okay. Ooh, that sounds good. I'm starving. Let's okay, go. good to know. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Actually, I went to Hamji Park on your recommendation after seeing oh, it on your table. Oh, yeah? Did you like it? Oh, it was so good. It was so good. So good. Yeah. Well, thank you all so oh, much. Actually, I do have a oh, question. You, oh, please, Joanna. Yeah. Ask us. So this is inspired by where we're at, Central Library, surrounded by books and stories. And I remember, um, no, I'm not Chinese, but the first experience of... <clears throat> Seeing characters in a book was Joy Luck Club for me. Oh so, yeah, what that was, was a good one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> what was your first experience um, of media representation? Seeing something, whether it was a book or a movie say, or TV show. Do you want positive show? or maybe not as positive? I guess either. Okay, well, I'll, I'll yeah. give you maybe one that was not so positive and then one that was, um, which is so. Do you guys remember the book um, Ricky Tiki Tembo? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> second grade. <laughs> There was I a book still know the name. Yep. called Ricky, Ricky Tiki Tembo. Tembo. No, um, it's probably not, yeah, probably not even in this library anymore, but it was this book written by this white woman about a Chinese boy and his brother, and she made up all of these like cultural things about Chinese culture that were just completely fake. And she's like, oh, in Chinese culture, the, the oldest child gets a name that is, you know, 30 syllables long, and the second child only gets a one-syllable name. I'm like, that's a lie. Huh? That is not true. And I remember the librarian at my elementary school would make me read it to her. Oh. I know. Oh. I know. Isn't that so embarrassing for her now? Um, <laughs> but, like, she would make me read it, and it didn't, like, occur to me until I got older. I was like, oh. She made me read it because I was one of the only Asian kids in my class. 
I should write a strongly worded letter to that woman if she's still with us. But, you know, like it was crazy. But actually, Joanna, yours um, and mine is the same. Uh, Joy Luck Club was the book. It was the book. And then and when the movie, movie came yeah. out, I was like, oh my God, look at all these Asian women on this screen. This feels so powerful. But I was a little older. I was maybe in like my first year of college or maybe like just out of high school. And I was like, this is the most Asian representation all at once that I've ever seen with the exception of like the background actors on that show MASH. Do you guys remember that show MASH? Yeah. It was like set in the Korean war and they would have like three Korean people just standing in the background, even though the rest of the entire cast was all white people. <laughs> I was like, oh, so yes, that's the best I'm going to get. Or that show um, Kung Fu. Remember that show Kung Fu? I'm old, sorry. Um, <laughs> that show Kung Fu, where the main character who was supposed to be Chinese was played by an actor named David Carradine who was not Chinese. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is the, the representation I guess I get <laughs> as yeah. a child. So Joy Luck Club was very profound for me for that reason. Yeah, Tiki Tiki Tembo was my first book too, but the f first movie representation I would say is probably Data from The Goonies. Oh. And like I loved him so Love much, him, so but I now. hated him so much only because people would compare me to him like all the time. And I was like, I do not speak with an accent. I was like, I don't. But now what you could do is make that trench coat that has like the hands up punch yeah. out. <laughs> so I did want that. that you, you but then that. I always did kind of feel bad because once you grew up, you realize that like Ki Kwan didn't fake an accent. You know, no. yeah, that was his. But to see him reemerge re yeah. this way now a days is also very healing. It really does bookend that yeah. that whole experience. But well, hey, Tony, I, uh, <laughs> I got, that's Frank again. Okay, but I got a friend and uh, my, my my coworkers who work in Jefferson, Indiana. Right now, they're enjoying the Netflix special of Warrior. Oh yeah, I haven't I haven't and, seen that. And they just it? some for, of it for me. I see them. That's tough. But I want everybody to see them. Yes. That's well, you know, and I think that's important too. Is like that back to that question of like, oh, do you know karate? It's like, no, and yes, but we're also you know not one dimensional, and that's not you know our entire personality. So I think a show like Warrior, from what I understand, does show a multi dimensional you know human being. So that's also very very important, and you know it speaks to everything we've been talking about. We're good. Nobody has any other questions. We live very exciting lives. <laughs> yes, hi. Yeah, I'm just uh, realizing something uh, listening to you, both of you, um, you know, because you're talking about Vietnamese, Koreans, and all that. I'm Latino in, you know, El Salvador. And then I'm thinking, you know, Mexico all the way to Argentina, you know. Do you see your, uh, how does that compare in terms of Asian people? Do they, support each other or this is this their animosity because i noticed that you know between latinos it's like oh no you're from cuba oh boy yeah. you're from uh you know paraguay what that's a very important question and i think there has been and is still today a lot of colorism in asian culture and i think a lot of people who are of east asian cultures like japanese chinese and korean feel one way and i think you know Pacific Islanders feel a different way and Native Hawaiians feel a different way. That's why we even separate them in, you know, the, the name of this month. Um, and and uh, the unfortunate reality is that, yes, there has been a lot of colorism and there's been a lot of, you know, unfortunate separation and division between. Um, but I think having these important celebrations together helps to galvanize us and helps to, you know, reinforce the idea and the understanding that we are not as different as previous generations might have led us to believe um, with classism and colorism and things like that. So hopefully um, as we progress and we keep opening doors to each other and inviting each other in and creating spaces for each other, um, those divisions and those lines will get, you know, blurry, so blurry. In fact, they'll disappear is my yeah. hope. Uh, I get a lot of people telling, like thanking me for including, you know, all the different types of Asian, you know, types of content, history, victims and things like that. And I think that is the one thing in the Asian community that I wish we were a little bit stronger at. We're being supportive one another um, instead of, you know, trying to divide ourselves. Cause yes, we do have individual cultures that should be celebrated equally, but sure. we do also need to come together so that we are a force to be. And this with. is how you do it. You ask uncomfortable questions and you sit in that discomfort and you say like, 
yeah, I have done that. And I do admit that I have felt that way about this particular type of person. And I'm working towards not feeling that way anymore and understanding them to a point where I won't feel that way or I will check myself when I do, you know, because yeah, we have, you know, there are, we have a lifetime of information that we have processed one way or another. Like it's not easy to just change our minds overnight. It's a, it's work. It takes work. Then, and, and you know, you, if you're willing to do it, then, you know, I think that's that's all we can really hope for. Yeah, like we're all different, but we're all kind of also the same. You know, I've also really been noticing that. I started this series called Asian Eats Asian where I try to eat all the Asian food that I've never had before. And uh, you, you kind of notice that like different, but very similar, you know, and it's- I think Relatability, it's, yeah, identifying exactly. yourself within something else. Yep. That I think that is the really best important. way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Wait, is someone back one there? Up top. Besides all the early stereotypes, did you ever get the religion question? Ooh, question? Religion. Oh, religion. That is a dicey one. Um, yes. Uh, my family, with the exception of my immediate family, my aunts and uncles, um, really religious. Really religious. Have their had their own church. Um, pastors, ministers, all in my family, all my cousins. They call themselves PKs. If you don't know what that means, it means preacher kid, preacher's kid. Um, super, super religious. Um, I I don't want to be offensive to anybody who may be religious, but fortunately for me, who I'm I am not particularly religious. My parents never forced me uh, to be religious. We did go to to church and we did sing in the choir, things like that. But it was definitely something that they did not force upon me, um, probably because they themselves, you know, questioned religion. Uh, so yes, I got the question, but I had a very easy like, no, nope, not not me. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, my mom actually did force me to go to church. I think mostly because when we were living in Philadelphia, it was a way for me to connect with other Korean kids. Um, and then she even made me go to like multiple churches so that I could meet more Korean kids. And then, um, so I went to church, you know, up until high school when I left. And the reason I don't go anymore um, has nothing to do with my relationship with God or anything like that or my beliefs. But um, my mom was a single mother. And I remember distinctly, I was sleeping over my best friend from church's house. And that morning I woke up like super early cause I had to go to the bathroom and the bathroom happened to be right next to his parents' room. And his mom, I could hear her on the phone. I don't even know who she was on the phone with at 7.30 in the morning. That's wild to me. But I heard her say, yeah, Ed's mom went to Korea and like pawned her son off to me. And I remember being like, what? no, she didn't. Hmm. Your son and I wanted to watch a movie. So we scheduled it and you said it was okay. And since then I was like, you know what? I don't trust people. And I just, I didn't, I knew that they were like religion and people of the church are separate and that whatever relationship I want to have moving forward didn't have to include these people. Yeah. So I'm pretty convinced the only reason I really went to church was because my parents were like, well, your cousins are there. So just go there. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to church now. <laughs> also the food was delicious. Oh my God. I'm not going to lie. Have you guys ever been in a yeah. buffet line at a Korean yeah. church? It's the Tri best. Korean potlucks oh are amazing. <laughs> they stand yeah. there with a giant rice pot and yeah. they've all the, the it's like chop chip. And every then at the end week? of the line, there's always donuts. You're like, oh, yeah, bonus donut. <laughs> Delicious. Okay, just one last, last question. <laughs> okay, my I have Argentinian, Brazilian, Latino Asians. They speak Spanish fluently, oh, mm -hmm. and it's beautiful. And my Japanese American friends, uh, it's beautiful. I um and, and just it's it's the Latino Asian. What are we? What are you guys talking about? The Latino Asian. Yes. Um, I have a friend actually. She's Japanese, but she was born and raised in Mexico. So when she speaks Spanish, I mean, I know this sounds silly, but my brain is like, whoa, what's so what a trip? I was watching a TikTok, and there was these Korean guys doing like this video or whatever, and I'm like, why can't I understand what they're saying? And they're speaking German. I was like. What? Oh, I've never seen Korean people speak German. Like it was, I don't, my brain just didn't connect it. I'm just so accustomed to seeing Asian people either speaking whatever native Asian language they speak or, you know, English, but I would like tripped out. So when she speaks Spanish or when we go out to restaurants, I'm like, this is so cool. I love it. Yeah. I absolutely love I it. I know there's a lot of Korean people that immigrated to Brazil. Yes, yeah, yeah, a yeah. lot. Or yeah, Mexico too. Yeah, yeah. There's even this content creator, her and her family, I think are from Argentina and they speak Spanish and make Argentinian food all the time. And I'm always like, so intriguing. Well, when my parents first moved here, um, they lived and worked in East LA 
So they, pro- I would, I would approximate that my mother probably spoke equal parts Spanish to English, you know, as she was learning. So when I watch my mother speak Spanish, I'm like, that is a trip. That is so trippy. I love it. It's my favorite thing. So, you know, then that's the beauty of, of where we live. Again, I just, I cannot speak highly, more highly about living in Los Angeles, born and raised, yeah. never leaving. I love Los Angeles. I'll never, I never have nowhere else to go. <laughs> that's right. Surf in the morning, ski in the evening if you really want to. (laughs) But thank you all so much for being here and for sitting with us for the last hour. This has been so much fun. We were not not nervous um, about doing this. We've never done a podcast in front of people before. So you guys actually made it really easy yeah. and it's been really fun. Usually and it's we just appreciate Archie so much. and our producer, yeah. Ron. We have like a, our dogs and yeah. our producer and my garage. So to be in front of you was, I was intimidated. So thank you so much for making us yeah. feel so at ease. <laughs> Yeah. And thank, thank you, you, Joanna, yeah, for allowing you. us to be here. Thank and you. And to the library. Thank you. Oh, do you want to do the outro? <laughs> yeah, do the outro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us on another podcast episode. You can find us online. You can find me on Instagram at Sujio one I'm sorry. You can find me on TikTok and Instagram at Sujio one And I'm at Etch-A-Sketch with a J on everything. And other than that, you can find our podcast on all the podcast platforms and on YouTube. And if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you like, subscribe, and ding. Otherwise, (laughs) thank you for joining us. And we'll see you all on the next one. Okay, Okay, bye. bye. (laughs) Thank you so much. That was so fun. All right, thank you today for joining us and celebrating with us. And thank you to the Library Foundation for their generous support for this event. Happy AAPI Night. Happy AAPI Heritage Month.